Okay, everyone, I think we'll begin. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Amy Sam. I am the Health Education Project, Project Specialist at the Maxwell and Eleanor Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General Hospital. Today's program is part of our MGHFC Parenting Series. It's a special collaboration between the Blum Center and Mass General Hospital for Children. Before we begin, just want to go over a few items with you all. Please be aware that today's session is being recorded for educational purposes. If you're interested in viewing a recording of today's session, feel free to visit our Blum Center website at massgeneral.org forward slash Blum hyphen center. Please be aware that everyone is in listen only mode. Everyone has been muted to reduce background so that we can hear our guest speaker today. If you have any questions, please use the chat button. Look at the bottom of your screen. Only Blum Center staff the co-host and guest speaker will see your questions. We'll have questions for them. Um, we'll have time for them at the end. Please don't share any personal medical information or questions in the chat box. If you have a personal medical question, please ask a doctor. Next, I would like to introduce you all to Brianna Beckfold. She is the project manager and editor for Mass General Hospital for Children, and she will introduce you all to today's speaker. Great, thank you, Amy. So good afternoon, I hope you're all doing well and thank you for coming to this virtual session of the MGHFC Parenting Series where experts share their knowledge with patients, family and staff on various pediatric health topics. This year, we've decided to host the series with the Blum Patient Family Learning Center at Mass General. My name is Brianna Beckbold and I'm a project manager and editor at Mass General Hospital for Children, which is the pediatric branch of MGH. And today we have Dr. Anna Georgiopoulos, um, from Child and Adolescent Psychiatry, and she's going to speak on ways to prevent, recognize, and manage emotional distress when parenting a child with a chronic illness. So before we begin, I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr. Georgiopoulos is an assistant in research in the MGH Clinical and Research Programs in Pediatric Psychopharmacology and Adult ADHD, and a consulting child psychiatrist in the MGH Pediatric Cystic Fibrosis Program. She's worked in, um, the Medical Devices Group at the U.S. Food and Drug Administration and has published many articles and chapters on ADHD, mood disorders, and psychiatric education and diagnostics. Her work on ADHD and depression and anxiety in children with chronic illnesses received the Pilot Research Award from the American Academy, excuse me, Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. She's also received the Joyce and Richard Tedlow Award for Excellence in Integrating uh, psychotherapy, psychopharmacology, and clinical research, and awards from the Minnesota Psychiatric Society and Academy of Doctor, uh, excuse me, of uh, Psychosomatic Medicine. Dr. Georgiopoulos graduated from Yale University and completed her medical degree and internship at the Mayo Clinic. She completed her training in child and adult psychiatry at MGH McLean, and she's going to present today until around 1245, at which point I'll take questions from the audience in the chat box. So from here, I will hand it off to Dr. Georgiopoulos. Thank you very much for that lovely introduction. Um, I'm going to be speaking today about parenting a child with chronic illness and uh, considering how to promote emotional wellness. And uh, the, following our, my disclosures, I've had support from the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, Dutch CF Foundation, Johns Hopkins University, and Vertex Pharmaceuticals. And this is an outline of what uh, I'd like to cover today. First, to talk a bit about stress and resilience, and then parenting strategies that can help a child grow to be able to take care of uh, him or herself well, uh, living with a chronic illness. Uh, then to talk a bit about depression and anxiety and specifically anxiety about medical procedures um, and to spend some time focusing on how caregivers, uh, parents or guardians taking care of a child with chronic illness can care for themselves and then to focus for a moment on siblings and I have a few resources at the end. Okay, so first stress and resilience. Um, so it can be, uh, of course, very stressful living with chronic illness. And throughout this presentation, I'm going to uh, spend most of my focus on living with cystic fibrosis since um, I'm the consultant for the Cystic Fibrosis Center at Mass General Hospital. This is the 
uh, area that I know well, um, but this should apply to um, other kinds of chronic illnesses that a child can have uh, living with diabetes, uh, inflammatory bowel disease, all kinds of other conditions that uh, are common in children. So uh, for those who aren't aware of what uh, cystic fibrosis or CF is, it's usually diagnosed in infants. It's a genetic condition uh, that uh, can require a complex treatment regimen that could take hours per day. It can be airway clearance to remove mucus from the lungs. Um, kids with CF have to take oral enzymes to help them digest food every single time they have a meal or a snack. And uh, there are plenty of other medicines that, that they need to take in either pill form or through a nebulizer, sometimes injections for their CF-related diabetes. Uh, they need to boost their caloric intake to grow adequately. So there's a lot of energy uh, that goes into making sure they have enough to eat. And uh, some kids may uh, need hospital stays for IV antibiotics uh, or other treatments that require them to miss schools and activities. So um, you can see that that, uh, that could create some stress. And uh, here on the right uh, are some, a list of various stressors that are associated with uh, living with CF, but again, may apply to other conditions as well. So um, a diagnosis that might be unexpected, particularly when, uh, when you hear that this might be a lifelong condition, um, keeping up with this daily care regimen, feeling different from other kids. Uh, how, what do I tell my friends? Do I tell people at school? Do I tell my teachers? How do I feel about my body? Sometimes kids with CF uh, need to have, for example, a G-tube, so a tube that goes into their stomach to help them get enough calories. How does that feel? Or if they're not growing or uh, maturing at the same rate as other kids, um, that can have an impact on how they eat. Um, disruption of uh, activities, financial stress for the family, um, having to navigate the healthcare system and insurance system, which we all know are very complicated. And then just coping with living with the disease itself, the physical symptoms, the uh, medical procedures, pain that might arise, and then more existential concerns about uh, what does this mean? Uh, you know, what's my life going to be like? Um, and uh, many of the, um, you'll see many of the uh, uh, pictures here in the slides are going to come from uh, Cystic Fibrosis Foundation um, related materials that we've developed as part of the uh, CF uh, Foundation Mental Health Advisory Committee. So I'd like to acknowledge them as I go forward. So what, what is resilience? Um, so resilience doesn't mean that nothing bad ever happens to you. It's, it's that when something happens, we have a capacity for personal strength and we can all build that capacity. It's not something you either have or don't have. Um, you can learn to build resilience by uh, learning useful thoughts and actions that you can have in response to a stressful event or circumstance. And you could think of it like opposite ends of the scale. So um, when there's a change in health status, it's gonna pull you down towards feeling less resilient. But if you do some self-care activities, you might be able to counterbalance the negative impact of stress and, and put your back, yourself back into, um, into feeling more balanced and more resilient. But what, what is the impact of stress on the body? Well, um, I think many of us are familiar with how this feels. Certainly in this year, we all are having some muscle tension, body aches and pains. Uh, it might feel, we might feel more short of breath, which can then make us feel even more anxious as we notice that we feel a short of breath. Heart rate can start to go up. Our blood pressure could go up. Our stress hormones are being released all over the place and that can make it harder for our body to regulate glucose production. Um, our sleep might be off, our eating is off. Maybe we are having more or less physical activity than usual and uh, we're not digesting our food as well. So all kinds of, of physiologic impacts on the body. Um, but also stress impacts our thoughts and emotions. So when we are under stress, we may be more likely to focus on the negative, uh, focus not so much on what's happening in the moment, but, but thoughts about you know, what happened before and kind of ruminating or going over them again and again, or worries about the future. Um, focusing more on absolutes like all or nothing thinking, right? So you know, this is definitely going to happen or this always happens or this will never happen. It can be hard to concentrate and make decisions. Um, and then we can feel all kinds of a, a mixed emotions with that as well. Anger, sadness, fear, regret, worry, confusion. Um, and this can lead us to avoidance. We want to avoid those thoughts, those feelings. We might underreact to things, kind of like being a bit in denial, or we might overreact to something small when we're under stress. And um, sometimes uh, we may not manage stress very well at all. And uh, over time, that might lead to anxiety, depression, 
um, changes in health, trouble keeping up with daily medical care. So again, if you have a child who has a chronic illness or an adult as well, it's hard when you're feeling more down or stressed to, to keep doing what you need to do to stay healthy. It may be, uh, you may see trouble in school or a child may start to develop problems with peers uh, or with family members. Um, and uh, substance misuse is, misuse is also a common um, non-adaptive or less adaptive way of managing stress. So I'd like to show you a video um, now about um, uh, from the CF Foundation of a uh, young woman uh, with CF who talks about substance misuse. And it may just, uh, bear with me a second, it may just take me a minute to um, find my way to that uh, YouTube. I feel like this, what the CF community needs to know about substance misuse is how common it is. Um, I think a lot of people, and it's not even just the CF community, has this notion that um, people living with a disability or a chronic illness, they live in these bubbles and they don't have the same desires as everybody else. They don't want to escape. They don't feel emotions or you know whatever and I, I think it's important to address that we're still human beings we still struggle and and that's what's really hard is you're living with this chronic illness but on top of that you just have reality to deal with and that's just two things that can equally be very very difficult so to try to deal with them at the same time it is mentally and emotionally very exhausting and I think that's why a lot of people um, do turn to substance misuse. And it's important to normalize the discussion. Okay. So again, um, I think it's nice to have uh, you know people living with illness be able to to speak for themselves to tell us what that is like. Um, so, what are some ways to manage stress or promote resilience? Um, there are many techniques that are evidence based that can be very helpful. Um, one of them is deep breathing, uh, so mindfulness techniques. Another is guided imagery. Um, we could even try this a little bit today. So, um, you know, from where you are, you can um, kind of sit comfortably, close your eyes if you'd like to, and breathe in deeply through your nose while counting to four. Hold the breath for one second, and then breathe out slowly through your mouth while counting to four again. And when you breathe, Breathe in, you want to expand your belly to feel bigger. And when you breathe out, you want to feel your um, your belly shrinking. So let's just try that one more time. So we'll count to four, breathe in deeply through your nose. One, two, three, four. Hold your breath for one second. And now breathe out slowly through your mouth while counting to four. One, two, three, so that's uh, just a small introduction for people who haven't used um, mindfulness techniques before. There are some resources at the end of the um, slideshow that will tell you, give you some free apps that are available um, for developing this kind of a practice. This is the kind of thing you want to use in a preemptive way. So if you um, learn these skills uh, when you're feeling uh, relatively okay, then in a more stressful time, your child should be able to um, to draw on these skills to uh, help relax. Okay, and then the other thing that's important is to make sure to um, think about how medical and mental health teams um, that uh, work with kids with chronic illness might be able to help. So um, they can help promote uh, wellness um, activities like sleeping, physical activity, nutrition, um, help kids learn how to take care of themselves so that as they get older they can take on more of the responsibility for managing their treatments uh, and um, 
and self-care. Um, they can give some anticipatory guidance at different times, different um, uh, and ages and stages, different kinds of problems will come up, such as learning to toilet train for younger kids, uh, dealing with being at school, or what's it going to be like when I go to college, and who am I going to tell, how am I going to do my treatments or, or have access to medical care. Um, when people grow up and, and want to think about building a family of their own, and also what it's like uh, if um, they're feeling worse and if disease is progressing. Uh, and most importantly, to try to build effective communication with your team and trusting relationships so that your uh, child feels comfortable to talk about what's on, what's on their mind. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about parenting strategies that can promote self-care. Um, so um, as a child grows up, it's really important for them to understand what's happening. Um, sometimes we try to protect our children um, because we think things could be really scary for them to know about, but often what they're imagining might be more scary than the reality. And certainly uh, it is not such a great way to find things out uh, by overhearing them or searching something online and finding out information that might be inaccurate or outdated or are not applicable to them. So um, try to call the disease and its treatments by their real names. Um, of course, you're going to be developmentally appropriate and not overwhelm a child with information. You wanna consider whether your child is someone who wants to know everything and that helps them manage their anxiety or if it's someone who kind of says, no, I know you've got it. I don't really need to know the details. Um, but welcome their questions and then be essentially honest in the responses that you give them so that, that they don't end up feeling like it's not something that can be talked about uh, and because you really don't want your child to be worrying alone when, uh, when the family is coping with this. Um, and similarly, we want to encourage children to express their feelings. So um, some kids, though, uh, won't want to talk, and that's okay, um, but they, um, they may like to draw. Kids can express their feelings through telling stories about characters in a book or a movie um, or making up stories. They can express their feelings through play, and you may see medical themes in their play, like char uh, characters they're playing out who are going to doctor visits or having um, some sort of a physical problem or uh, having to do a medical procedure, and that's that's okay, that's uh, generally good. It means that he's he or she's trying to work through um, these feelings. Um, some kids express their feelings most through physical touch, so hugging um, or doing something together, going for a walk. And it's also important to give children ways to start to name their feelings, so um, to uh, help reflect to them, oh, you know, it seems like you're sad about um, what's happening, that your, your stomach doesn't feel good, or that, you know, you're angry that we've got to go to this doctor appointment and you're going to miss your um, uh, uh, you know, time that you were going to spend with your friend, right? So um, these things are all okay, and you can also model this by sharing your own feelings. Um, and sometimes kids may say things that are hard to hear, right? They might express that they're really, um, they're really upset that they have this disease, they don't want it, or they're mad because we're not, you know, solving it for them uh, more quickly. And even if it's hard to hear, uh, it's important to be a good listener because that can really be therapeutic for kids and help them learn resilient ways of coping. Okay, so here's an example uh, of problem solving. So another um, kind of strategy that you can uh, help your kid learn to um, to solve all the kinds of problems that can come up when you're uh, when you're growing up with an illness. So in this case, this is a college age um, kid, um, Kevin. He's a 19 year old with CF. He had just finished his first year of college. He hadn't really really told too many people that he had CF. Um, and he was gonna go out for a pizza at the end of the week with some friends. And remember I said kids with CF, they have to take their enzymes. Um, it could be like five or six or seven pills all at once before they eat. And he didn't really wanna do that in front of his friends. So how can he figure out using problem solving how to take his enzymes before he eats to make sure he stays healthy, he doesn't have stomach pain or diarrhea or um, other kinds of symptoms and he gets the nutrients out of his food without having to disclose his CFD to anyone because right now he's not comfortable to do that. Um, so in this example here, um, the example is Kevin working with his respiratory therapist, but this could be Kevin plus a parent. This could be Kevin plus, um, you know, especially if he were, uh, you know, a younger adolescent or, or a child, uh, there could be someone from the medical team and the child and a parent present together, working together. Um, but the first step is to define the problem. So he says, I don't want to take my enzymes in front of my new friends, but I also don't want to end up with a stomach ache. So it's a who, what, 
uh, when and where. College friends, I don't want them to see me when this Friday night where the pizza, pizza place. And then you want to brainstorm solutions. So he starts with the first solutions solution, and then he and his therapist, and again, if there were a parent there, it could be three people, take turns generating solutions. So you write them on a sticky note, and you, you know, put them up on the wall, uh, or you could put them in the chat if you're on Zoom these days, right? Um, and, and the idea is that nobody can, um, uh, nobody can put down the solutions at this stage. We're just generating any kind of solution that, that, that comes to mind. So one would be go to the bathroom and take the enzymes with water. One would be say you gotta, gotta go make a phone call and then go to your car, go to the bathroom and take them out of view. You could put them in a can of mints and pretend you're taking mints and probably no one will notice. You could say you forgot your phone and then go to the car, take your enzymes and come back. You could take them at the table and if somebody says, what, what are you doing? You can say, oh, these are probiotics for, they help me with my digestion. Digestion. You don't have to disclose that they're enzymes. So these were the solutions that they came up with and they voted on solutions. And um, the idea here is that uh, you, you generate solutions that everyone can agree on. So Kevin voted down uh, solution three and five, but um, Kevin and his respiratory therapist said yes to one, two, and four, and then he gets to choose which to try first. And if you can't find a solution that everyone agrees on, then you generate more solutions until you come up with at least one choice, hopefully more than one, that, that everyone can agree on. And then the child or adolescent or young adult can, can pick which one he wants to try. And then these other solutions are backup plans. And so um, he, you know, he picked number one, which was to go to the bathroom, take them with water, and he's going to give it a shot this Friday. So that's, that's an example of problem solving that can be used for all kinds of different um, barriers that can come up with uh, when you have chronic illness. Okay, and now um, I'd like to talk about another kind of model that can be used to um, uh, to help kids growing up with chronic illness. It's, uh, there's a kind of therapy called acceptance and commitment therapy or ACT. And so um, in this model of parenting, you're thinking about accepting, choosing, and taking action. So first of all, you want to attend to your thoughts and feelings and experiences as a parent. And you're kind of modeling this as a parent so that your child kind of learns some of these skills too. So that can help you effectively nurture, set limits, teach and respond. It doesn't mean you're going to change the thoughts and feelings. You may have uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. You probably will have some negative thoughts and feelings when you're dealing with this kind of thing in your family. Um, but first you, you attend to them and accept them and then you're going to compassionately acknowledge and accept these experience experiences in the service of pursuing your values. So thinking about what are your values, what are your vulnerabilities, uh, and, and the same for your child and the family as a way of thinking through um, how to act in that way rather than just reacting to those thoughts and feelings um, in a kind of quicker, um, quicker, unfiltered way. So our mind really can have constant chatter, right? As parents, we can be thinking uh, when, when we're having a hard time, should I have even had a child? I don't want to I just want to be a parent. I can't handle working as well. Or, you know, am I going to mess everything up by the way I'm parenting? Um, should I be micromanaging more? Should I be stepping back? Uh, are other parents doing this better than I am? This really seems unfair. We can be worrying about our kids, right? Does, does he like me? Uh, is he upset? About does he like himself? Um, is the way he's behaving now, does this mean things are going to really fall apart when he's an adolescent? Um, you know, if she can't um, fall asleep by herself now, is she never going to, you know, be able to go off to college by herself? Um, you know, so, so we have a lot of worries. And then when there's chronic illness um, in the picture, then, uh, then that can really add to things. What does the symptom mean? You know, is this this is so frustrating. Does she even need this medicine? Am I doing a good job teaching him about his illness? I, this is terrible. What did we do to deserve this? I hate this disease. And so all of these are um, uh, understandable feelings and actually some, some of them are helpful feelings, right? You want to think about, am I doing a good job or is this a necessary medicine? But they're, they're helpful until they're unhelpful. Um, and so what we want is uh, to have more mindful parenting as opposed to um, this constant chatter, which then can turn into experiential avoidance. So uh, experiential avoidance is related to parenting stress. So when parents are stressed, we try to not think about the chronic illness we, by tuning out, staying distracted, keeping busy, avoiding situations. Uh, we might 
be arguing with ourselves in our minds and kind of overanalyzing things. And that can lead us to be rigid and inflexible. So we might overreact, underreact, and, and in the end, we're paying more, more attention to the, the chatter in our minds than to the needs of, of our child. Um, so some examples of experiential avoidance could be um, watching a movie instead of having a conversation that you know needs to happen. I think I'll go, I'll go, well, you know, go through some episodes of something here and not, not do that. Um, if there's some conflict with a child about whether, uh, you know, about doing treatments, then maybe we'll just let it go and not do them because it's not, you know, it's not worth the effort to try to figure out how to get through this. Canceling appointments because you might be afraid to hear the news or, or you know, it's going to be, you can get some resistance from your child. Or, um, you know, when they ask to stay home from, from school and you know that they don't really need to, kind of letting that just happen. So, um, but the problem is with this kind of, you um, experiential avoidance you know the harder you the harder you work to to solve all this by by attending to by um you know having this chatter going on in your mind uh the worse it gets so it's um trying to figure out how to um uh t take yourself out of that pressure to avoid making mistakes and figure out what works so and there are all these different kinds of areas where we have to figure out what works how do we get treatments in um how do we prepare for transitions? How do we advocate for school kids in the school setting? And so again, we want to accept, choose, and take action. So first of all, recognize that we're having thoughts, feelings, and experiences, which some are positive, some are not so positive, but accept that there might be some negative ones. Um, do our best to appreciate ourselves and our child, understand what the triggers and context are, and then choose. So identify what you know, why am I parenting? What are my values? Um, I, I'm going to work towards what's meaningful instead of from a, coming from a place of fear and then commit to pursuing those values with integrity. So even though it's difficult, even though I don't feel like doing this, you know, I'm going to figure out what works. And, um, and that's pretty, that kind of stance is kind of critical for uh, consistent parenting. Okay, so next I'll talk more about depression and anxiety. So this is and we talked about when when stress can become increased, um, it can lead to depression and anxiety. And uh, negative emotions are, of course, a normal part of uh, the human experience. It, it makes sense to feel sad when something sad is happening. Um, when avoidance starts, that can become problematic. So depression could be marked by um, in, in a child or or someone else in the family sadness, loss of interest in fun activities, being more withdrawn changes in sleep or eating, poor motivation, and loss of hope. And anxiety, again, also is normal, it's adaptive, but it can become problematic when avoidance kicks in. You might notice fear, panic, worry, um, outbursts, or kind of shutting down and freezing, and again, changes in sleep or eating. Um, and in people with chronic illness, uh, kids with chronic illness and their parents, uh, depression and anxiety are common. This is some data from um, a major study in the cystic fibrosis community of um, over 6,000 individuals with CF and um, over 2,000 parents. And you see that the rates of depression and anxiety are two to three times that that's expected in the community. And as kids get older, they tend to experience more, but um, you can see on, on uh, the right here, fathers and mothers in green and blue are um, are the highest. We worry a lot about our kids. Okay, and why does it matter? Um, well, there's obviously a lower quality of life or suffering when someone has symptoms of depression or anxiety. Um, they can lead to trouble taking care of yourself, uh, sustaining your daily care. Um, and uh, also poor health outcomes, in particular for depression, uh, it can really make it hard to take care of yourself and in, for people with cystic fibrosis, um, a one-time screening for depression five years later is correlated with um, less survival. So it's it's really important uh, to our overall health. And this is uh, an example, uh, this is just a um, showing you that the cystic fibrosis community uh, internationally has come up with a um, protocol for screening every single person with CF from starting at the age of 12 and also parents of kids with CF uh, from the ages of birth to age 17, um, screening them for depression and anxiety and um, referring to treatment when needed. And it's it makes sense to treat when um, or to, to screen when there's a treatment that's available. And it's really important to understand that depression and anxiety are very treatable um, for both kids and adults and also for people with chronic illness, both kids and adults. 
And this is an example of a, um, a study of depression in adolescents. This is a classic study, uh, randomized trial of over 400 adolescents with depression, um, where they either were treated with medication, an SSRI uh, known as fluoxetine or Prozac, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is an evidence-based psychotherapy, um, or they were treated with a placebo medication, um, uh, or they were um, treated with a combination of medication and cognitive behavioral therapy. And you see here that, that the combination was the most effective. And this is just kind of the very first uh, level of treatment. 71% of adolescents were uh, much improved or very much improved. And suicidal thinking also improved with, with this treatment. And the same for anxiety. This study um, that I'm showing here, the CAM study was for children ages seven to 17. Um, and again, the combination of an SSRI and this plus cognitive behavioral therapy was the most effective and 81% were um, much improved or very much improved with that but first um, effort at treatment. So I'd like to spend a little time talking about anxiety around medical procedures since this is a special kind of anxiety that um, kids with chronic illness are more prone to have. Um, and you'll see here some examples of what you might see uh, if kids are, are scared about having a procedure. They could, instead of looking, saying, I'm nervous, they might be irritable, angry, or aggressive. They might be crying or screaming, refusing to cooperate. They might say they feel detached from reality. So I'm going to show you another video where uh, a parent of a child with CF will uh, comment on this a little bit. Dean gets nervous and upset or anxious about anything that's going on in the clinic. He kind of shuts down. He'll sometimes will sit on the floor and try to turn into a little bit of a ball, cry, go away from wherever we are, and try to just kind of not have that happen. Okay, so how can we help kids prepare for medical procedures? Um, some kids benefit from not knowing. They, you know, it's going to be hard for them if they're thinking about this weeks in advance, but some really do need time to ask questions and create a plan so they can feel ready. So you can develop and share a comfort plan that lists what they need to help them relax and cope. So they might have choices uh, like watching the procedure or not watching, um, where on their body they can get the shot. Sometimes they could have the option whether they get, for example, like a throat culture at the beginning of the clinic visit or at the end of the clinic visit. So what makes them the most comfortable? And they can actually write this down and bring it to show people, okay, before you draw my blood, here's what you, you need to know about me. Here's what's going to help me. Um, get a full night's sleep. And for some kids, if you've tried uh, behavioral um, coping strategies, it might be useful to have some medications to manage pain or anxiety as well if... Um, if the behavioral strategies are not effective, effective enough by themselves. Okay, so I'm going to uh, show another video about managing anxiety during medical procedures. This video is um, Uh, as a child life specialist who's going to comment on what's effective. Hopefully it will pull up momentarily.
couple key techniques that I think are really helpful when addressing anxiety in the moment of the procedure. The first is a comfort position. So this allows the parent or their trusted adult to facilitate a hold that's not only keeping them safe during their medical procedure, but is there to provide that tangible, positive touch and that comfort and support. The next thing that I like to utilize is alternative focus or distraction. And that is offering the child the ability to take their mind to a new place, to focus on something else besides the procedure at hand. For other kids who do better and feel more in control when they know what's happening, we let them watch so that they feel confident that they know what's happening to their body and it gives them that sense of control. Okay, so um, again, you, you can think about how to, um, what you might bring to the procedure, like a comfort object um, and model a calm voice, smiling, breathing slowly, right? Kids pick up on our own anxiety, so if we can be as calm as possible, make sure that we, we as parents understand um, what the procedure is being done for, who's gonna do it, why it's gonna be done, then we can be more relaxed and model that for our kids and praise uh, cooperation and positive coping. And sometimes you can try some distractions um, during a procedure like listening to music or watching a, a funny video. Okay, so now I'll move on to talking about- Welcome to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation oh. CF Education Day webcast. Oh Cystic dear. Cystic Fibrosis Diagnosis in Adulthood. I'm Leslie Hazel, Director of Patient Resources at the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation. This webcast is... That is not what we wanted to hear. Sorry about that. Um, all right. So coming back to caring for the caregiver. Okay. So... Um, caring for a child with chronic illness can be really stressful um, and uh, this is one framework of, of some of the, we talked about some of the ways it's stressful to, to have chronic illness in the family, um, financial strain, um, dealing with the healthcare system. You've got normal parenting tasks, and then on top of that, illness specific tasks. Um, and uh, there can be a de decrease in marital satisfaction uh, and an increase in depression. This is a model from a study of, of families living with CF. So I'm going to show another video. This will be the last video in this series here today of uh, a caregiver talking about managing their own coping. My name is Kat Quinn and I have two children. My eldest is Naley and she has CF and my youngest is Elsie and she does not have CF. I had a very different experience than most families because Naley was diagnosed at three. And so um, those first three years of her life were very terrifying, trying to figure out what was wrong with her and not having answers. And so when Naley was diagnosed while cystic fibrosis was a terrifying um, label to be given to her, it was, there was an also a feeling of relief that we actually had a place to start working now. We had, we had treatments, we had opportunities to help get her back to being healthy. The emotional aspect of CF is probably the most impactful aspect of everything. It's that feeling of being out of control, not being able to fix something. No one can go through what we go through every day watching our children in pain or struggling to breathe or being, you know, being the one to hold them down for a procedure and not feel some sort of anxiety and depression. There would just be nothing in you if you didn't feel that. And so it doesn't matter how amazing your support system is. It doesn't matter how amazing, you know, all the other moments in your life are. There are these key points within the CF life that absolutely rip you apart. With all the hurdles that we have, um, that if you're not healthy, you cannot take care of your children. And I think that needs to be the focus is we are their role model for how they'll be caring for themselves. 
I think that mental health screening for both patients and caregivers should definitely be something that starts from the beginning. Having support systems in place that allow for caregivers to really um, unload about that feeling and, and have um, ideas as to how to kind of push through those times, you know, right when those first clinic visits happen that, that it's just implemented into part of the routine maintenance. I mean, how's your lung function? How's your BMI? How is your mental health as well as your child's? Just to kind of have that be, that screening be a part of all the other screenings that happen so that when a red flag comes up, it can be addressed in a very non-confrontational environment that makes everyone feel like it's just part of, it's just part of the care. I think normalizing um, the emotions that accompany the diagnosis and the disease progression is uh, the first kind of point to get back to where I need to be to be the best caregiver for me. Right? And just does such a nice job of talking about how important it is to um, for our caregivers to be able to recognize how how they're feeling um, and model that for their children. Um, and these are a couple of studies of the impact of depression and anxiety in a parent caregiver on a child with cystic fibrosis. So um, in the large study, uh, the TIDE study I talked about earlier, where I, I showed the graphs of the um, high rates of depression and anxiety in people with CF, um, and their caregivers, uh, the, um, uh, Dr. Quitner and her colleagues looked at dyad, so parents and their adolescents who were both screened. And uh, she saw that if one parent had an elevated score for depression or anxiety, the adoles uh, adolescents were almost five times more likely to have elevated depression symptoms and three and a half times more likely to have elevated anxiety symptoms. So um, when there's stress with one person in the family, it's likely to impact others in the family as well. And also um, uh, Dave Barker and Dr. Quitner uh, did a study of the physical health of children with CF. So this was younger children in the one to 13 year age range. 30% um, of the parents in that study had elevated depression scores. And um, they looked at how people did with uh, taking their enzymes. We talked about, you know, having to take these enzymes at every meal or snack to be able to digest food. And when parents were depressed, um, their children were less likely to get those enzymes. And then their, their weight actually didn't, uh, they didn't gain weight as expected at the next clinic visit, which is a, a really important marker of health for CF. So um, when our children are feeling well, they can take care of themselves better. And when parents are feeling well, they can take care of their kids more easily. And so again, this is just a, um, to remind me to mention that, you know, in the CF world, uh, it's internationally part of the standard of care to be asking caregivers about how they're feeling um, and giving them support prevention and support um, even when symptoms are, are relatively mild and refer for treatment when, um, uh, when they're starting to feel like they have more distress. These are some uh, some strategies for self-care for caregivers. So um, you can break self-care down into physical, emotional, and spiritual care. Um, on the physical end, eating well, getting enough sleep, even though it's really hard to fit that in, it helps you be more productive the next day. Um, exercising, limiting screen time, trying to get outdoors, making sure as the caregiver that you're taking care of your own preventative medical care uh, and thinking about your own health emotionally, staying connected to people that you find supportive in your life, being able to delegate tasks, asking for help, finding healthy ways to express your emotions, um, stopping and recognizing uh, negative thinking patterns, saying no to things that are too much or don't make sense for you, making sure to schedule in time for fun and use humor, uh, and, and making sure to celebrate life milestones even when, uh, when things are, are sometimes rough. And then on the spiritual side, uh, this can be more uh, formal worship um, communities, but also quiet reflection, uh, practicing gratitude, keeping a journal, and having time for, for play and creativity in your life. And so lastly, uh, I'd like to talk about siblings um, who often uh, can feel like 
they're getting the short end of the stick. And in fact, this is a, another study by Dr. Quitner, um, an older study, but still um, rings true, where uh, there were two groups of families, one where um, the older child was healthy, but the younger child had CF and uh, another group of families where neither child had a chronic illness. And uh, they did home interviews, nightly phone interviews, daily diaries to see how much time was spent uh, with um, uh, I think in this case, they were all mothers and uh, each child in the family. And uh, the areas here, which, which are circled, meal times, playtime, medical care, um, these are all areas where the sibling got less attention. Of course, it makes sense for medical care that the sibling didn't need a lot of time spent on doing medical treatments, but you, you also saw that um, there was less time spent together eating together or importantly playing together. Um, so it's really important to, um, to spend special time with siblings uh, whenever it's possible. And even five minutes a day of um, letting a child play, and this could go for the child with, with illness as well, um, letting them take the lead and do some play and just following their lead um, five minutes a day can make a, a really major difference. Um, but they're all different kinds of ways of carving out special time. And realizing that, that siblings may adjust differently um, when there's a health crisis, it's helpful as much as possible to keep to everyday routines, um, to continue to set limits. So the rules are still the rules. There might be some flexibility, but not, um, but keeping structure helps kids stay secure, um, allowing them to keep having fun. They don't have to stop doing fun things because their sibling is, is not feeling well. They don't have to feel guilty that they're feeling okay when their sibling is, is um, not feeling well and helping them feel involved and connected. So sometimes siblings like to meet the medical team so they can really picture what's going on, this kind of black box of what happens in the hospital or at these visits. Allow them to be involved and help out at home as long as it's not too much pressure, you're not putting them in the position of, of being another parent and helping them keep in touch, for example, if there's a hospitalization. So um, finally here are just, uh, these are some books that um, Stephanie Foligno, who, who uh, provided some of the information about acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, these are some, some books that she suggested. I think you're, you're gonna be able to access uh, this um, presentation again in a recorded version. So um, you should be able to find, to find these if you need them. Um, this is the Mass General website uh, guide to mental health resources. There are a lot of resources for um, adults, for children, for families. Um, so you can look at that website. And then um, on the right here is um, a list of relaxation apps that are all free um, that you could use as well. Um, and that could be used for kids or, or adults in many cases. Um, and those are from, that list is from, in the problem solving example, also from the books Facing Cystic Fibrosis. This is a book series that's put out by the MGH Psychiatry Academy, Guides for Patients and Their Families. You can see there's a list of all different kinds of conditions and more on the way. Um, so um, again, these examples were from cystic fibrosis, but there may be some other nice resources that are um, condition specific um, for people as well. Um, so I'd like to thank uh, Stephanie Foligno, Beth Smith, and Alexandra Quitner, who um, uh, have uh, been collaborators and, and provided uh, some, of, some of these resources. And of course, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation Mental Health Advisory Committee, which, as I mentioned, um, helped develop these um, videos and resources and the, the CF Foundation for supporting um, the importance of, of mental health in um, holistic care of people with chronic illness. And I'm uh, happy to take any questions now. Okay. Let's give people a few minutes to put their questions into the chat box. So if you have any questions, please do so. Okay, I don't see any questions coming through at the moment. Okay. 
Okay. Um, we have a few people who say thank you. This is a great presentation, which it was. Um, and I don't see any other questions coming through. So um, for time's sake, I think we can wrap up early. And a uh, big thank you to Dr. Georgopoulos for a great presentation. Thank you, so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Thank you.